Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ed Baylog, the president of Aquinas College, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here for this afternoon's presentation. Uh, welcome back, those of you who have been here, and welcome for the first time those that are here to hear this uh, uh, really world-famous uh, expert in the area that we're all very interested in these days. I call your attention for, to the back of your program to give you an idea of how concerned we are at the college uh, about these issues. Um, and I think uh, and when it says uh, the long-range campus plan includes matching our energy needs and use as well as educating our entire campus community on ways to conserve energy leads me to the reason that I'm really here, and that's to introduce you to Jonathan Weggie. Uh, Jonathan has been interested in sustainability issues uh, for quite a while. Uh, it's a delight to see him carry on the commitment to sustainability and biodiversity issues that the, his father and the Wege Foundation uh, have established. Jonathan's working very closely with us at the college uh, to help us establish uh, a more energy efficient operation. And it's uh, my pleasure now to introduce to you Mr. Jonathan Wege. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's my honor to be here today to introduce the uh, 2009 Weggy Lecturer, uh, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy. And, um, but before I get into that, um, I just would like to tell a couple of jokes because most of the time my father gets up here and starts with a joke, but he regrets that he couldn't be here, but he sends some jokes. <laughs> And I, I count, he counseled me earlier on, on a couple and they, they needed to be uh, known because everybody knows his jokes and everybody's heard them and they get funnier as they go along. So I, I hope I don't do them in dishonor here. So a uh, three-legged dog walks into the bar, walks up to the bartender and says, I'm looking for the man who shot my paw. <laughs> That's for my dad. And then for, uh, for Tom Lovejoy, who is uh, actually the, the uh, father of the term biodiversity, I have a biodiversity joke, which was actually given to me by another uh, who may want to remain nameless. So, oddly enough, it's another bar joke. A uh, penguin goes into the bar, says to the bartender, have you seen my son around here anywhere? The bartender says, I don't know, what does he look like? <laughs> that I'm keeping up the tra tradition, if I get the groans, dad would be very proud. So, um, all joking aside, um, I've known uh, Tom Lovejoy for four years now, and I've served on one of the Heinz Center boards. And uh, Tom has been uh, president of the Heinz Center. And uh, he didn't get there by sitting on his laurels. He is a, uh, an accomplished scientist. Um, he's been a champion for the environment for a long time. We'll just leave it at that. He served uh, as uh, science advisors to several presidents. Uh, and uh, that's uh, both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, he's uh, also uh, been really brought attention to the rainforest. He's the guy that's really brought this forward and has worked with any of the major people that you see today in, in the world working on these issues. Uh, so I would, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, present uh, Dr. Tom Lovejoy. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Well, thank you, and uh, did I tell you the one about, no. <laughs> uh, so, it is uh, it's a special treat for me uh, to have been uh, in Grand Rapids today, surely one of the most special communities uh, in the entire 50 states, uh, and also very special honor to be here with you uh, at Aquinas College uh, as your guest and also of the Wege Foundation, which has, has done and continues to do so very much to chart a better future uh, for us all. 
So I'm going to talk about climate change, what it means for the living planet on which we all depend. Uh, and I will also, and it's, a, it's not a pretty picture, so get prepared for that. Uh, but then I'm going to go on and talk about how nature can be part of how we address that challenge and some of the things uh, that we need to do about it and which in fact represent uh, extraordinary opportunities if you can think in the kind of creative ways that this community uh, has done for so very long. So climate change, of course, is news uh, everywhere. That's not news uh, to anybody. Uh, and it's in the media. Uh, and I would just, in passing, uh, offer this set of images for you of three familiar urban landscapes, Washington, New York, uh, and San Francisco. Across the top, uh, under current configurations, and across the bottom with just two to three feet of sea level rise. And I draw your attention to the lower right, where San Francisco Bay, with three feet of sea level rise, literally triples in area. So I have followed this whole topic of climate change and the interaction with nature uh, for about 30, uh, 25 years. Uh, and I've done two books on it. The first one came out in 1992 at the time of the Earth Summit. And at that point, one could only sort of sort of project what might happen by look, looking at how nature had responded to climate change in the past. Uh, by the time the second book came out with Lee Hanna in 2005, uh, one could see nature responding literally almost everywhere uh, one looked. So just a couple points about climate change itself. Uh, in 1896, uh, the Swedish scientist Arrhenius uh, answered the question of why is the planet a habitable temperature for human beings and other forms of life? So, I mean, why is it a habitable temperature for ourselves and other forms of life? And the answer, and this was 1896, the answer uh, was greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect. Uh, so this is actually really old science uh, in many uh, uh, ways of thinking about it. And it's quite interesting that Arrhenius was such a good scientist that he calculated with pencil and paper what doubling pre-industrial levels of CO2 would do to the Earth's temperature and came out exactly where the big fancy computer models uh, project. Uh, what Arrhenius did not know was the details of the history of the temperature of the planet uh, over the last 120,000 years uh, as presented here. And you, you see that for most of this, abrupt climate change, in fact, uh, is the normal condition in contrast to the gradual linear uh, way the computer models work. Uh, but most important of all, that little bit in the upper right-hand corner, the last 10,000 years, has been a period of unusual stability in the planet's climate. And in that 10,000 years is all human recorded history, significant portion of our unrecorded history, the origins of agriculture, and the origin of human settlements. So it basically makes the point that the entire human enterprise is based on the assumption of a stable climate. Also during those 10,000 years, all ecosystems have been adjusting to a stable climate. So as we know, greenhouse gases have been climbing rapidly, uh, mostly from fossil fuel uh, combustion and uh, some land use change. Uh, and the uh, Earth's climate system uh, is already responding. We are about three quarters of a degree warmer than in pre-industrial times. And because of lags in the system, there's another half a degree uh, already in the pipeline. 
Uh, and the bad news here about all of this is that our emissions of greenhouse gases are going up even more rapidly than the worst case scenarios of the intergovernmental panel on climate change. Uh, obviously not good news at all. Uh, but what I want to talk to you about for the remainder of this afternoon's talk is how is nature responding to that? Uh, where might nature be responding and how in the future? Uh, and then most importantly, what can we do about it? So the first uh, set of changes in nature are all around the solid and liquid phases of water. Uh, so lakes are freezing up later in the autumn, and the ice is breaking up earlier in the spring. Glaciers are retreating in most parts of the world. By 2030 and probably earlier, Glacier National Park will be that only in name. And in the tropics where there are glaciers on top of really high mountains like Mount Kilimanjaro, all tropical glaciers are retreating at a rate that they will be gone by 2013. So if Hemingway was writing his short story today, he uh, would have to choose a different title. Uh, but the most dramatic changes about the liquid and solid phase of water are those uh, in the Arctic regions of the planet. And here you'll see about 20 years of the annual expansion and retreat of the ice sheet which floats on the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and what you will see in the course of this uh, is that the low point uh, gets lower and lower every year. In fact, it seems to be accelerating. So the original estimates, maybe 10 years ago, of the first year in which there would be uh, a moment when the entire Arctic Ocean would be ice-free uh, was 2100. And then it was moved to 2050. Uh, and now they talk about 2030 and even sooner. So this whole process is accelerating. Uh, and one can see that also in the behavior of glaciers. Uh, in Greenland, where there's an enormous glacier, of course, uh, when the glaciers move, they create sort of seismic activity like earthquakes. Uh, and what you can see here is the frequency of that seismic activity is also accelerating. So too is melting of the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, and the consequence is that sea level is rising uh, until recently only because of the thermal expansion of water. As water warms, it occupies more volume. Uh, but to that, more recently is being added uh, melt from glaciers on the land. So if you go to the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge uh, on Chesapeake Bay on the eastern shore, uh, where there is also natural subsidence of the land combined with sea level rise, uh, you can see that the Blackwater Refuge is well on its way to becoming a marine refuge. Uh, there is most probably uh, an increased frequency of more intense tropical storms. The science on this one has not been entirely nailed down yet, uh, but it certainly seems to be headed in that direction. Uh, but there is no question about the increased frequency of wildfires in the American West. It is statistically significant and linked to longer, drier summers and earlier snowmelt. Uh, that's news. We see it on the television. We see it in our newspapers. Uh, <clears throat> but the rest of what I'll talk about is all about the biology of our planet and how it is responding and where it may be going. So what we're seeing is many, many species changing the timing of their annual cycle. Uh, so lilacs are blooming earlier in New England. Several species of flowers are blooming earlier at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew uh, outside of London. And it is not just plants that are changing their timing. 
animals are changing their timing as well. So for example, tree swallows are migrating earlier, nesting earlier, and laying their eggs earlier. Uh, one species of hummingbird in North America has even ceased to migrate. Uh, and species are changing where they occur. So the Edis checker spot butterfly is one of the two best researched uh, species of butterflies uh, in North America. And it has clearly been moving northward and upward in altitude uh, in its uh, range, in its geographic range. And the same kinds of things are being recorded uh, with butterfly species uh, in Europe. Uh, and the National Arbor Day Foundation, uh, which is hardly some wild-eyed uh, environmental terrorist organization, uh, but really, really about people who just love to plant trees, little, literally found it necessary to publish uh, a new hardiness zone map so tree lovers will know which species uh, they can plant with success uh, where they happen to live. Uh, there are also going to be uh, health uh, risks that come from uh, climate change. Uh, and this is sort of a generic portrayal of some come from the heat, some come from the change of distribution of disease vectors, uh, extreme weather events, and the like. But it's really here as a placeholder to make the point that not only will human health be affected by all of this, but we can anticipate that both domestic and wild plant and animal species will have uh, health consequences as well. Uh, and this totally incomprehensible slide is here to make the point that what I've just been telling you uh, is not just a matter of individual examples or anecdotes. This is now statistically robust. There is no question nature is on the move in response to climate change. Uh, it's happening not only in the land, it's happening in the ocean. So plankton species are changing uh, their distributions. Fish species are changing their distributions. Uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, America's greatest estuary, the eelgrass communities, uh, which are particularly rich and diverse and productive, uh, turn out uh, to have a situation in which the eelgrass itself is very temperature sensitive, has a very strict upper temperature limit. And as a consequence, the southern distribution of the eelgrass communities has been moving steadily northward year after year in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, these changes are not only in the Arctic, not only in the temperate zone, they're also occurring in the tropics. Uh, this is the legendary cloud forest of Monteverde in Costa Rica, uh, a kind of forest that depends essentially entirely on condensation uh, from clouds as its source of moisture. Uh, so it's, it's, that's why they're called cloud forests. Almost no rain, just condensation from clouds. And what has been happening to Monteverde is there, the altitude at which clouds form has been moving up. And the consequence of this is that Monteverde uh, has been experiencing an increasing frequency of dry days, uh, which is not a good thing, obviously, if the entire forest depends on clouds. And it is believed that the first terrestrial species driven to extinction by climate change uh, is this golden toad uh, from Monteverde. Um, in the oceans, the equivalent of the tropical forests, uh, the marvelous, diverse, technicolor, uh, productive uh, tropical coral reefs all look like this when I was a graduate student. I mean, you really had to work to find a tropical coral reef in those days, uh, which wasn't a vibrant uh, ecosystem like this. Well, it turns out, much like the eelgrass, uh, the coral reefs are very sensitive to elevation and temperature. And what it does is it affects the fundamental partnership, which is what lies at the 
the base of the tropical reef ecosystem, namely a partnership between a coral animal and an alga. And with only a couple degrees of elevation of temperature, the coral animal expels the alga. And so suddenly this entire technicolor world uh, undergoes what's called a bleaching event. So the technicolor becomes black and white, the diversity plummets, the productivity plummets, uh, the economic benefits for local communities plummet. Uh, so uh, of course there are a whole set of species whose life histories are built around the presence of ice. Uh, and the polar bear is the poster child for that. Uh, but I will return to that particular question a little later. So that's what's happening at the moment. Uh, little ripples, relatively minor ripples uh, through nature, but almost everywhere one looks in the world. So the question, really important question, is what does it look like looking ahead? Uh, so the first attempt to actually estimate what doubling pre-industrial levels of greenhouse gases would do to the biodiversity of the planet came out in this paper in January 2004, projected 20 to 30 percent of all species uh, would be driven to extinction. Uh, and the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is uh, basically a very conservative uh, operation, uh, confirmed that number uh, in 2007. So temperature will continue to increase. It will be more towards the poles, but particularly towards uh, the northern latitudes. Uh, there's more land in the northern hemisphere, uh, and that tends to drive the temperature increases. Uh, but it's not just temperature that's going to increase. It's also issues of precipitation and water. And if you stop to think for a minute, the two most important physical aspects of nature for any organism that lives on land is temperature and moisture. And both of those are going to be changing. The two most important physical aspects uh, for aquatic organisms is temperature uh, and pH or acidity, which I will get back to in a bit. So we're already beginning to see uh, drawing trends uh, around the prairie pothole regions uh, in the middle of this country. The underpinning of the great central North American flyway. And we're beginning to see what are known as decoupling events, where two species or two aspects of nature uh, which have been tightly uh, coordinated in timing uh, actually have achieved that with one of them being driven by changes in temperature and the other by changes in day length. Uh, and now those are no longer in synchrony. Uh, and so you get things like the snowshoe hare in bright uh, white winter pelage, uh, greatly conspicuous in landscapes uh, without snow, uh, just great sort of targets for predators. Uh, so people are beginning to pick up decoupling events like that all over the place. Uh, another interesting thing one can do is when you really know a lot about a species, you can project what climate change might do to where uh, it will occur. So sugar maple is one of those species. Uh, and by those in the northeastern and uh, upper middle west uh, United States, uh, much beloved for its autumn foliage, uh, and of course maple sugar and maple syrup. Uh, with double pre-industrial levels of greenhouse gases, all five major computer models say that if you like those things, care about those things, you will have to go to Canada. Cold water species, uh, particularly ones like trout, uh, will also be affected. And so it's going to change the fly fishing map of North America. Uh, that really caught Senator John Warner's attention. Uh, and he now, as a fly fisherman, uh, and he now is going to spend the rest of his career working on environment and climate change. 
Uh, we're also going to see an interaction of climate change with other kinds of environmental problems. Uh, and this is an example of that, the emerald ash borer, uh, an invasive beetle uh, from Asia, rather pretty beetle actually, but uh, it has a big appetite for the American ash. Uh, and aided by climate change, which gives it a longer summer in which to do its boring. Uh, and generally speaking, milder winters, so more of the ash borers over winter. Uh, it is going through the American ash uh, in this country from Wisconsin to Fairfax County, Virginia, uh, at a very, very rapid rate. Uh, as a class, Organisms which live in high places will be particularly in trouble uh, because it's very simple, you know, moving up, following their temperature uh, needs, they will eventually no longer have any further up to go. Uh, and this is one of these species, a actually marvelous little animal re related to uh, rabbits, uh, which lives on high mountains in in the Rockies in about a dozen separate populations. Uh, and this is the first species that probably will be listed as endangered uh, because of climate change. So high altitude species will be in trouble. Uh, coastal species will certainly be challenged. Uh, and with rising sea levels, some of them will cope and some not so well. Uh, but certainly those on low lying islands like the key deer uh, will, with sea level rise, ultimately have nowhere to go. So high altitude species and low lying island species are, as a class, particularly endangered by climate change. Uh, coral bleaching will inevitably increase uh, in frequency, so it becomes really difficult to imagine a sanguine future for tropical coral reefs. Uh, and then there are complications about all of this. Uh, and if you stop and think about it, and certainly in this part of the world, one is quite aware of the glacial times. Uh, you know, climate change is not new in the history of life on Earth. You know, glaciers came and went here and in, in the Northeast. Uh, and we didn't seem to lose a lot of biological diversity in the process. Uh, the species were somehow able to track their required conditions. Well, the big difference between then and today, of course, uh, is that our landscapes are highly fragmented. This kind of pattern uh, from a Wisconsin township and forest uh, in which you start with relatively continuous forests and end up with a set of fragments on the landscape is pretty typical of how landscapes have uh, gone in most parts of the world. And what that means is when the plant and animal species are trying to track their conditions, uh, they're basically going to encounter an obstacle course. As former director of the National Zoo, Mike Robinson, likes to say, or liked to say, you know, the species would move, but Philadelphia will be in the way. Uh, so this is one complication which it's pretty easy to figure out what you can do about it, what the prescription should be. And that's just put natural connections back in the landscape, something for which uh, there are often other reasons to do as well. And you can actually get sort of triple win uh, kinds of things out of it. The next one is much more uh, challenging. Uh, and what we, what we know with greater climate change uh, when it gets beyond the minor ripple stage, uh, is that it's individual species that are moving when the climate changes. It's not the biological communities. Uh, so here you're looking at uh, three mammal species, two tree species, and an insect species, uh, and their movements after the retreat of the last glacier in Europe. And you can see there's absolutely no pattern in common. And what this means is that as these species move, the ecosystems that we know will literally disassemble. And the surviving species 
will reassemble into configurations which it's really hard to imagine in advance. Uh, third complication, uh, which we know is the case, is change is not going to be linear or gradual. It simply will not be that way. Climate system doesn't work that way. It has things in it like this global, global conveyor belt, uh, which moves heat around the oceans of the planet, really important in, in the way the climate currently works. And it has been known to shut down uh, in the geologic past. Uh, but even at the same time uh, as that might be lying in wait, we are already seeing uh, abrupt change in ecosystems. What's happening with, with tropical coral reefs, bleaching events is the prime example so far in the ocean. Uh, the, the, what is happening to evergreen forests in North America and parts of Europe uh, is the prime example uh, in the terrestrial realm. And basically, in this particular case, it involves a native pine bark beetle uh, which suddenly becomes at an advantage when the summers are longer and it can have one more generation and more of them get to overwinter. So here we're looking at pine, bartle, pine bark beetle outbreaks uh, in British Columbia over about a 35 year period. And in the early phase here, you may not even be able to see the little pin, pinpricks of red of the annual outbreaks. Uh, but as the summers get effectively longer, uh, the beetles get to do better. This big cold winter in 85, but a lot, a lot of them made it through. Uh, and this continues to build up uh, to the point where in British Columbia, southern Alaska, uh, large parts of, of the American West, you literally have 70% of the pines are dead. Drive from Colorado, uh, Denver Airport, up to Vail, 70% of the trees are dead. It is a huge timber management problem. It is a huge fire management problem. Uh, nobody knows uh, what the recovery pattern of those ecosystems will be, uh, although it seems unlikely uh, that uh, the, uh, the beetle won't continue to have the upper hand. So we're already seeing abrupt cli climate ch uh, ecosystem change. Uh, we're also going to see even bigger scale change, what I call system change. Uh, so. Uh, this is one of the most fun images I've ever found. Uh, it's put together by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And it, sh it basically shows the dynamics of water in the, uh, the atmosphere uh, around the planet uh, hour by hour uh, through the year. And I will not take you through the whole year, I assure you. Uh, but you see that most of the generation is over the equator and over the oceans. Uh, but if you look at the right of this, you'll see uh, that as the moisture comes off the tropical Atlantic and enters the Amazon, the Amazon also is generating moisture. And it has an extraordinary hydrological cycle that takes the moisture that comes off the Atlantic and then recycles it going across the continent. And that's why there's a rainforest. Uh, well, in 2005, that system broke down. Changes of circulation in the tropical Atlantic, little moisture reaching the Amazon. So you had the greatest recorded drought in the history of the Amazon. Uh, and a situation which, in fact, is predicted at 2 and a half degrees by the computer models, uh, leading to something called Amazon dieback. Uh, so if we get to that point, if we let it get to that point, you lose probably half of the Amazon forest, tremendous amount of forest, tremendous amount of biodiversity, and yet another uh, great pulse of carbon going up into the atmosphere. 
an even greater system change in, in many senses is the sleeper issue of the rising acidity of the world's oceans. Uh, something that basically caught, caught us all by surprise. The oceans take up a lot of the CO2 we throw up in the atmosphere, and we've been applauding that because it's basically meaning there, there's less climate change than there otherwise would be, but ignored was the fact that a, a fraction of that CO2 uh, is converted into carbonic acid. So today the oceans are a tenth of a pH unit more acid than in pre-industrial times. Uh, doesn't sound very big, but that's one of those logarithmic scales. So that means 30% more acid. So just for starters, it's sort of shaking to think that we could have changed something that big uh, about the state of our planet. Uh, so why does one worry about acidification of the oceans? Uh, the primary reason, we think, uh, is that there are tens of thousands of species that build their shells uh, and their skeletons from calcium carbonate, uh, clams, for example. Uh, and they do that by uh, using a calcium carbonate equilibrium and that equilibrium is dependent on temperature and acidity. So the colder it is and the more acid it is, the harder it is to mobilize uh, the calcium carbonate. Uh, so that is a serious challenge for lots of species, most of whom almost none of us know the names of, and some of them are tiny little things that exist in the gazillions uh, at the base of food chains. And this is one of those, one of my favorite marine organisms, it's called a pteropod or sea butterfly, and it's actually a tiny little snail. And sort of the foot that a snail no normally travels along is adapted to sort of flap in the water, as you'll see here, to keep it up in the water column. And it's very important at the base of some food chains. Well, as, this, as the oceans become more acid, you literally get to a point uh, where organisms like this will have their shells go into solution while the animal is still alive. Uh, and we're already seeing effects at the base of the food chain uh, off Alaska and in the North Atlantic, uh, precisely where you would expect to see it because it's colder. So uh, we're beginning to see the first signs of system change in the sense of the thawing of the of the permafrost uh, in northern Eurasia and in North America. And there's a lot, it turns out there's a lot of uh, frozen methane and other greenhouse gases that have been immobilized up there and now uh, could actually contribute to uh, a runaway greenhouse effect. Uh, and what we do know is that the Earth system has critical thresholds in it. And nobody can tell you that we know a lot about that. Uh, but what is, what is clear from what I've been telling you is that we're, we're getting close to a point where we could be affecting those. And it just doesn't make sense uh, to do it. So when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, issued its last synthesis report, it included this graph. Uh, and temperature is going on, on the vertical uh, on the left. The red is the actual measured temperature increase from greenhouse gas increase. And the two black lines are hypothetical uh, curves uh, depending on X, Y, or Z. Uh, and on the right-hand side are some of the consequences at different temperature levels. So, we're three quarters of a degree with another half in the pipeline. That takes us to one and a quarter. Uh, at one and a half, uh, this says the coral reefs basically are gone. Uh, at two and a half is where you would have Amazon dieback. So literally, we're already halfway to Amazon dieback. So looking at all of this, uh, one begins to think, well, you know, how, how do we actually decide where to stop changing the planetary climate. And for a long time, 
those in conservation thought it should be at this target of 450 parts per million. Uh, that is, uh, to put it in context, relative to 280 parts per million, which is where the, the level was before uh, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and that is equivalent to maybe two or a bit higher degrees centigrade, average global temperature increase. Uh, there are all kinds of ice reasons to be concerned about it. Uh, but since we're already seeing those abrupt changes in ecosystems at three quarters of a degree, I have to conclude that that is too high as a target. Uh, or another way to look at it is the last time the planet was two degrees warmer, sea level was four to six meters higher. If you want a single sand bite to take home, that's probably it. Makes no sense. Uh, so I conclude, looking through biological glasses, that the safe level is probably 350 parts per million and below, which is where our most distinguished US climate expert, Jim Hansen, uh, also has been saying it should be uh, with a better understanding of climate uh, and the ice part of it uh, than I actually have. So that is a pretty grim situation. And the issue, of course, is what can you do about it? Uh, and I like to say that people in my profession have now become planet doctors. Uh, so this is Dr. Planet, and he's trying to figure out the diagnosis and the prescription. Uh, and there are about three different categories of things you can do. One is revise our conservation strategies so the natural world will be less vulnerable to the climate change uh, it is going to experience. Uh, second is what can you do about limiting greenhouse gas concentrations? Uh, and then the third, which is relatively new uh, and sort of exciting in a way, uh, is how we could use biology to take some of that CO2 out of the atmosphere. So in terms of conservation strategies, we already talked about putting natural connections into the landscape. Uh, obviously, if you minimize the other stresses on the natural world, you minimize the chance of negative synergies with climate change. Uh, you can also look, when you know a lot, at the particular situation of particular species. So. Uh, this happens to look at a species in South Africa in the Cape Floral Kingdom. But the point is, the big climate models, the big supercomputer ones, you know, there's like 200 kilometer units on a side. That doesn't tell you a lot if you're trying to manage landscapes and manage natural resources. Well, now it's possible to do downscaling, even on a laptop get some sense of what's likely to happen in the next 50 years on, say, a kilometer square basis. Uh, so that's going to really help us in making more intelligent decisions about managing the natural world and making it more adaptive uh, to climate change. Uh, and one thing we're going to find is that a lot of the protected areas created for particular species conservation uh, will no longer be able to help those species uh, because it's not a suitable climate for them. Uh, but that doesn't mean they aren't useful, because what it means is those are the safe havens from which those species will be able to move to their new safe locations. And what it really means is we will need more conservation, uh, not less. Um, huge energy agenda. And I'm particularly not going to get into that with with uh, Tom Kaiser and Jonathan Wege here. There's just a big energy agenda, uh, energy efficiency, energy conservation, renewables, uh, and the like. Uh, and it's way, way overdue to take it on big time. And that's why it's so exciting to come to a community like this one, which has seen it uh, coming and been doing things about it for so long. Uh, so what is not particularly well known is that maybe as much as 20% of annual emissions of greenhouse gases actually comes from the destruction of modern natural habitat, principally tropical forests. Uh, 
And so that's not a particularly good thing in any case. So anything you can do to reduce tropical deforestation will actually reduce annual emissions. And that's finally becoming a very active uh, topic as we head into the major climate negotiations uh, in December in Copenhagen. Uh, so let me give you a sense of uh, how all of this works in any given year. So uh, here you see at the top emissions from land use, tropical deforestation, plus a huge amount of emissions from the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, about 45% of it ends up in the atmosphere, uh, which is literally sort of the balance uh, after the close to 30% is absorbed by terrestrial ecosystems uh, and 26% by the oceans. Uh, so if one looked at it in a different way, the oceans and the terrestrial ecosystems literally uh, can be thought of as subsidizing the global economy uh, and protecting it uh, from a significant amount of climate change. Uh, and the number is not trivial. Uh, but the problem is with that increase in emissions, uh, the atmosphere, uh, the fraction that ends up in the atmosphere is growing uh, because the terrestrial ecosystems in the oceans uh, can no longer absorb uh, any more than they already have been. So then we start to worry about uh, once this stuff is up there, it stays there a long time. 100 to 1,000 years. So the uh, question becomes, are there ways we can pull it out of the atmosphere uh, before it has generated some of the climate change we had best avoid? And the answer, uh, the, at least the one answer we know of today, is pretty simple. It's called biology. You know, all plants and animals are made of carbon, including ourselves. Uh, and twice in the history of life on Earth, there have been moments when there have been very high CO2 levels brought down to something close to pre-industrial level. And the first time it came down uh, was w when we had plants uh, appearing on land. And the second time it came down was with the arrival of modern flowering plants. Uh, so the power of biology is not trivial as we think about all of this, although I would be the first to say it's not big enough to help us forget about the urgency of the energy agenda. So uh, the scientific estimate is, is something on the order of two to 250 billion tons of carbon have been lost from tropical uh, and other ecosystems, systems, terrestrial ecosystems uh, over the last three centuries. Uh, and what I am proposing, and have a lot of enthusiastic colleagues as well, is that we could restore some of those ecosystems, do some reforestation, uh, conduct agriculture in, in ways that returns carbon to the soil. So what we're looking at is a little conceptual diagram here, uh, just enough to make the point. Uh, and the numbers on the left are at the bottom, 280 parts per million, the pre-industrial level of greenhouse gases, 350, uh, the level uh, which I assert is the cap above which it's not safe, 390 where we are. So the REDD is uh, the technical term in negotiations for avoiding tropical deforestation. So if you're able to really kick that in, the increase goes up more slowly. Uh, and then probably overstated uh, in the green bars is the kind of carbon that could be pulled out of the atmosphere uh, by restoring terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, so that means uh, doing reforestation, managing forests in ways uh, that maximize their carbon uh, without doing uh, uh, damage to their biodiversity. Uh, it involves restoring degraded grazing lands. And what do you get when you do that? Better grazing. So that's one of those win-wins. The Australians think their grazing lands alone, they could pull half a billion tons of carbon a year out of the atmosphere. Uh, and it's also managing agriculture uh, in ways that this clearly oversimplifies, uh, but basically 
builds the carbon back up in the soil, uh, which in the end is a living uh, community. Uh, so, uh, and then special new techniques that are not entirely clear how far you can go with them. Uh, one called biochar, which puts in a uh, specialized uh, form of charcoal into the ground and it stays inert there and impro improves soil fertility literally for centuries. So the point I end up with here is that the natural world is more sensitive to climate change than absolutely anything uh, on the agenda. Uh, it's already being affected. Uh, it's a mistake to really take it much further. Uh, but happily, it can also help us uh, to uh, reduce the amount of climate change we face uh, by literally re-greening the emerald planet, or as I like to say, uh, make the living planet more livable by using the living planet. Thank you very much. So for questions, I guess people have to come to that microphone or that one. So. Anybody got a question, or have I really sort of shocked you too much? <laughs> I'd like to speak to that infestation of the British Columbia. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I'm sure they tried everything. The first thing that comes to my mind is spring, is a spring uh, with a, an effective uh, mixture that would seem to kill off the beetle and stop the infestation from moving forward. Well, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not an expert on all the things they've been doing for it. Uh, but what I get told uh, by uh, the foresters is it's only going to get worse, that it's really hard to control this situation. So, so it's probably going to turn into a different kind of forest, I think, is what's going to happen, or l a lesser vegetation. Well, thank you very much. Dutch pride themselves on their environmental material, but they uh, say they only have one nuclear power plant, but they import most of their energy from France, which is dependent on nuclear power. Windmills are about 1%. What are your comments concerning nuclear power? Well, uh, I personally think that in the short and maybe medium term, nuclear power has to be part of the mix uh, just because this challenge is so huge. And I know there are obvious downsides to it. Uh, but, you know, interestingly, one other fact about the Dutch is, you know, they're famous for holding back the sea. And now they realize they're not going to be able to continue to do that. So there's a national discussion about what they call strategic retreat. Um, and then interestingly, if you go to Denmark, it's a sea of wind farms. Uh, so you see different things all around. Um, yes? Is there any offset to the South Pole from the warm here? Is there a, might be an offset? Uh, it would, you know, the South, the South Pole sort of is affected by all of this uh, sort of in a delay function, uh, in part because there, there's patterns of winds around it that's sort of almost circular, uh, and they've gotten stronger, uh, which is part of the reason Australia is getting less rain. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there's also already uh, measurable changes in the glacier systems on Antarctica. So uh, clearly the Arctic is, is much more vulnerable, uh, but the Antarctic is not entirely immune. So. You mentioned the um, 
ocean and the ocean currents and the sorry the ocean currents well that's the question I'll repeat it the ocean currents and the conveyor belt you mentioned that it has stopped before in history can you tell us about the effects what it has so the, the question was about that global <laughs> conveyor belt and uh, what it what the consequences are when it's not running um, and the most immediate consequence is that you have uh, a local uh, or regional drop in temperature uh, on both sides of the North Atlantic uh, and uh, but that happens in a world which is nonetheless continuing to warm so it it uh, it's it's not easy to predict that one. Uh, and nobody really understands that much about it. Uh, it's actually seemed to have been flickering, uh, but nobody's been studying it for long enough to know whether it flickers occasionally anyway, so. Yes? I would like to address the role of buildings. Buildings are hugely important. Well, 70% of all electricity goes into operating buildings and the equipment, 70%. And 70% of all the energy that goes into the power system is lost in conversion to electricity. Those two figures alone say that we should focus Can on everybody hear him? No, no, no. no. Would, would you mind coming down? Yes, I come down. Oh, the microphone's coming to you. I would like to concentrate for a moment on the building industry. Now everybody can hear me? No? You know, like, a, like an ice cream cone. <laughs> I, I should swallow it, I think. Okay. Uh, the buildings are requiring 70% of all electricity in the United States. And 70% of all energy that goes into the power system is lost in conversion to electricity. So when you have these lights on, for instance, the efficiency is about 5%. Everything else is lost. So how could buildings be part of a biological system where we would harness the sun, the water, the air, and the soil, and actually make an environment that would be more productive, biologically speaking, than it is so destructive at the moment? So, so some of the experts on that are actually in the audience. Yes. Uh, Tom Kaiser up there and, and Jonathan Weggie's actually been working with that. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the, the greening of rooftops is just one example. Uh, but the way you actually, I mean, just huge amounts of energy are wasted in buildings. Uh, I mean, you can, you can hear it being wasted right now, right? Uh, that's all energy. Uh, so, as, as buildings move towards uh, various levels of, of LEED certification, they are moving in that direction. Uh, and buildings are also moving towards generating their own power. I mean, there are a whole series of things going on. Uh, but I'm not the real expert on that. But do you think it's fast enough? None of this is fast enough, right? We need, we need Tom to take over the world. <laughs> I hope this works. Is it working? It is. Yes. I think that we have been hearing about having more coal plants producing electricity or whatever using coal. I think that clean coal is definitely an oxymoron. What do you think? So uh, coal is is really the biggest challenge in the whole energy picture. Uh, it is the least efficient of all the fossil fuels, uh, and uh, so this, and yet it is you know the source of energy in so many places. And the Chinese are building a new power plant, coal-fired power plant, every week or something like that. And it's a staggering figure. Uh, so uh, the issue is 
uh, whether you can have really clean coal. And an awful lot of, of what is called clean coal actually is about dirt and soot and other things, but it's not about the CO2. Uh, but there are people uh, looking at ways to uh, burn coal and sequester that CO2, turn it into something like calcium carbonate. Tom Kaiser, and I know at least a year ago, was working on a special chimney to do that. Uh, but you know, until we're doing things like that or it's some of the carbon sequestration uh, notions where the CO2 gets pumped down into empty geological uh, formations, uh, which is not a panacea. Uh, you know, it'll work in some places and it's not the solution to the whole thing. But uh, unless you can do that, uh, coal is a really serious problem as we look at all of this. So I, I think there needs to be some massive investment in trying to figure out if, if there are ways uh, that we could still have coal as a major fuel source without the release of the CO2. Yes? Uh, could you help all of us here who are going to leave inspired by your talk to deal with the skeptics and the cynics in the world who say you're not telling the truth? <laughs> So, uh, you know, what, what it, it depends what the skeptics are saying, of course. Uh, is he, he's, he's, asked for, he's asked for help addressing the skeptics who say there is no climate change. Uh, well, you know, it's measured. You know, I mean, those are measurements, right? Uh, and often those people don't understand the difference between climate and weather. Right. Uh, weather, weather is, you know, like it's the temperature it is here today and it was what it was yesterday, significantly different. But the overall trend, the signal is what weather is. And there's no question about that signal. Uh, so my answer usually to those people is, you know, you really just ought to go do your homework. Uh, and uh, you know, the re one of the really telltale things is that last 10,000 years of a stable climate. I mean, we r really have adjusted to that. Uh, and put it another way, climate has to be important if we spend so much time talking about the weather, right? <laughs> a lot of questions. Don't forget the, the microphone is live on the other side. If you have any more questions you'd like to step up for that, Mike, I have uh. a question up here now. Uh, given the uh, magnitude of the problem, it appears that the only solution uh, is political, and that uh, the changing world uh, order is creating amazing differences and changes. How confident are you that politically the leaders of this world in the next five or ten years can actually uh, gather the political will to make the difference? So, uh, you know, it's, it's a really tough question to answer. Uh, but my answer is, you know, we have to be confident about that and we have to actually, through our own individual actions in society, give them the confidence to do the right thing. I mean, it's, it's got to come not only from enlightened leaders, uh, but also from the public who suddenly, you know, register what this means. Uh, it's just got to be there. So, uh, you know, without becoming sort of the neighborhood bore, <laughs> I really encourage you to talk to everybody you can uh, and, and enlist their interest and involvement in the political process and the rest. Yes? sea change in terms of how the administration, uh, the current administration, views this problem 
in comparison to past administrations? Uh, absolutely, there's a sea change uh, in Washington. Uh, the Secretary of Energy, the head of the National, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, the President's Science Advisor, uh, the uh, climate czar, energy environments are in the White House uh, are all just really, really top people who get it. And I, I had an hour with the czar uh, about 10 days before January 20. Uh, and she said to me, you know, not everybody in the administration gets it, but the president really gets it. Uh, and that's hugely important. Uh, and another thing that's happened is uh, the, the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, really gets it. He understands the scale of the kinds of things I was talking about. And he's got fire in his belly about it. So I, th I think there's, there's a lot that's working in the right direction. And some would say, you know, you know the, the economic uh, crisis that we're all living through, uh, uh, is, isn't that a terrible problem in, in terms of trying to do something about this? Uh, well, maybe, but I think it also, in a sense, has sort of shaken our, our direction of what the precise details of the economic model should be. Uh, and so I think there's a huge amount of opportunity here uh, for those who think up the new energy systems. Uh, you know, and the ones I was talking about earlier in this room are prime examples of that. They've built businesses around uh, improving energy use. In our biology class right now, we're doing a lot of discussion on the environmental issues that you just talked about, like climate change and pollution and stuff like that. And um, one observation we've come up with for all of them is that it really is the economy. What should we do right now? Focus on the economy or focus on the environment? And you kind of just touched on it, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Well, I mean, you, 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 can't, you, you can't address either one. Friedman uh, basically says uh, when he's in China, he says, you know, you guys want to continue building your power sector around dirty power. Why is going to build a whole new economy and we're going to come clean your clock? That's his exact <laughs> phrase. Uh, and that's exactly the way we should be looking at all of this. I mean, this is, you know, it, it, should we be, have been worrying about uh, blacksmiths at the beginning of the age of uh, the automobile uh, and sticking to horses? You know, it's, it's time to just think differently and say, you know, this is, uh, the, the whole, tr it's about transportation, not the internal combustion engine as we've used it for a hundred odd years. Uh, and, you know, you, whatever, are not an oil company. If you're really smart, you're an energy company. So I think that's the way you really need to look at it all. Yes? I just want to say this has been a really exciting week um, this week. Um, for four days on C-SPAN. I don't know if anybody else has seen it, but the Energy and Commerce Committee have been debating climate change legislation. So it's been very interesting. It was kicked off on Tuesday. They're still going on now. When I left home at about uh, 3 o'clock, I think they had 16 more speakers, and they've been going. Al Gore kicked it off this morning with uh, Senate, uh, former Senator John Warren and uh, Republican from yeah, uh, Virginia. Right. 
uh, very good discussions going on, and it is exactly as you said, it's the whole new green economy that is hopefully will pull us out of where we are now, turning all of our manufacturing businesses that have left the, Michigan, left the country, into producing renewables and wind turbines. So um, it's all happening now. Next week is starting the markup um, for climate change legislation. So I would encourage, uh, we've got four uh, legislators from Michigan on this Energy Commerce Committee. Representative Bart Stupak is one, uh, Representative Mike uh, Rogers, uh, Fred Upton, and um, I'm missing one. Oh yes, the most important, Representative John Dingle, who was the former chair of the committee. That's and right. he had great things to say today. So I would encourage everybody to contact your representatives and senators and tell them how important this is for you. Thank you, and, I, you and know, thanks and for being here today. Well, thank you, but I'd also say, you know, if you have any uncertainties about this, I mean, look how much has already happened in the right direction in this community. And you're a very remarkable community, uh, which can show show what can be done. It's just so lot more to be done. Dr. Look, we probably have time for one or two more questions. I have one right here. Um, with regard to the um, you know renewable energy manufacturing here in Michigan, um, while energy seems to get all of the headlines, we don't ever seem to talk as much about materials. And I guess my question would be. Um, what is the feasibility of building a hundred million wind turbines out of petrol-based plastics with fossil fuel-based energy manufacturing systems? Um, you know, it, I guess I'm curious about what type of innovations you've been seeing as far as the material side of thing goes. I, I just simply not an expert on all of that, uh, but I do know in some places there are a lot of lighter weight uh, things going into all of that, which therefore use less energy. Any additional questions? One over here. Hi. Um, I know that in Grand Rapids, as well as in the U.S. in general, we are working on getting better emissions and um, helping out the environment. but. I also know that countries like China and other developing countries are getting worse as um, time goes on. So I was just wondering if you have any suggestions about how we are to help them understand the importance of this and to help them. Well, that's a really good question, which is, uh, you know, the, uh, the number one emitter in the world now is China. It's surpassed the United States. Uh, and if you actually look at projections, uh, it will dwarf everything. China and India. Uh, so it's been pretty obvious to me for a long time uh, that we've got to work some kind of deal with those nations because until they are part of the solution, it gets very hard to move the international agreements. Uh, so when I did meet with uh, Carol Browner uh, before the inauguration, uh, she was already there, you know, she was already there about doing one-on-one -on -one negotiations and deals with China and one-on-one -on -one with India. Uh, I added Brazil to that because of their enormous uh, land use aspect. Uh, and it was, on, it was one of the two agenda items when the Secretary of State made her first trip to China. Uh, so that's how I think you do it. Uh, moving things in the formal negotiations with 180, 190 countries around the table, uh, all you get out of that is small increments of, unless there's some big agreements in advance. as grim as you do right now and with some hope in your hearts that what we've heard today and uh, the, the, uh, the
quality of, of uh, the research going into this will actually lead us to be able to deal with it. Uh, I think we can. I think Dr. Lovejoy thinks we can. Uh, so let's go out and do that. Thank you all for coming.